Okay, this is part two on the video series of I Never Knew You, The False Prophets. This is from Michael Bowen's book, uh, I Never Knew You. Uh, he's going to go through one video per pastor. He's got many pages on them, but we're going to just take the meat of what he says to show you that the famous preachers are preaching another gospel and were warned of the subtlety that beguiled Eve. Now, I'd like to mention nobody's accusing these pastors Nobody's saying they're not saved or calling them evil. This is just to show you that the gospel they preach is not biblical and cannot get you born again. Uh, there's a reason people, the world loves certain pastors. Um, the true gospel of grace is offensive to the proud. Uh, it puts everybody equal. How could that drunk be saved and not quit drinking? Huh? They're not going to have it. They're not going to have God's grace freely given to anyone that simply receives it so uh we're gonna go to the beginning look at my intro it's like 40 minutes long i'm sorry but i did do the intro and then one pastor in it which was joel osteen we said very nice things about him just that his gospel is not biblical okay again this is not to hurt anyone but so that you can be secure in salvation you need if you're saved you need to be secure and in full assurance of faith um, and standing in the Word of God and His promises. If you're not saved, then you need to be doubting and you need to trust in what Christ did. Please watch my video called The Last Adam so you can understand why your works have nothing to do with it and what Jesus actually accomplished. Right now, we're going to he is going to tell you about Pat Robertson's plan of salvation, which is different from the one Jesus gives us in the Bible. Uh, which is trusting in our Savior and His death, burial, and resurrection alone for eternal life. We've got to be saved first before we start dealing with discipleship and salvation, which so many pastors bring discipleship, which is work, into the salvific equation. All right, the plan of salvation, according to Pat Robertson. Let's start the chapter here. He says, before I cross swords with Pat Robertson on doctrinal issues in this chapter, I would first like to provide you with the necessary background concerning his worldwide ministry, most of which can be seen for yourself on CBN. He said it reaches approximately 200 countries via cable and satellite. Um, let's see if we can go down here. Uh, he said he used to watch the show every day, and he loved it. It talked about the news, food, current events, fashion, health. It's done with a mixture of professional decorum and genuine warmth and laughter. The folks at CBN are really wonderful people who provide a good service in terms of information and entertainment. But when it comes to an issue of a person's salvation, there are some points that I would like to raise in an effort to get you to both compare and to contrast for yourself the differences between what Christ has to say and what Pat Robertson has to say regarding regarding salvation okay now CBN's website has a thing you click on it says do you know Jesus and uh, we're gonna analyze Pat Robertson's stance on salvation upon reaching the home page of CBN's website the predominant item of choice for your consideration in this gold-colored phrase that asks quote do you know Jesus when this phrase is clicked at the time this chapter was written by the way with your mouse you were taken to a page entitled quote spiritual life and are presented with a set of four spiritual concepts they should have just given you the gospel. That it's a free gift. It's by grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. It's what Jesus did on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 gives a clear gospel. It's his death, burial, and resurrection that gives you eternal life. Period. But now we're going to go into four concepts of spiritual life. Let's see. He says, I will list them in the correct order. He said, my job in this case is to present an initially fair and unbiased look at the original source of information. All right, so under the first heading, you will see an assertion that says God loves you and he wants you to get to know him and that he wants to bless you. Romans 5, 1, John 3, 16, John 10, 10. It then asks the question of why it seems like so many people are angry or hurting if, after all, God meant for us to have a really blessed life with much peace. The reader then moves to step two. Within this category, a statement is made about how God did not make us to be like robots without freedom of choice, that he gave us free will, that he made us in his own image, that he wants our lives to be filled with much joy, but that we all disobey God because we're willfully sinful and that the gap between us and God can never be bridged by our own efforts. Sounds good so far. In solemn resolve, 
Step two ends by telling the reader there's only one way to reach God. This is where I get scary. Step three explains the remedy and asserts boldly that Jesus is the only answer to our problem. That's true. He died for us and came back from the dead, and we must make a choice. This leads us to the fourth and last step in the sequence in which Pat Robertson says, we must give ourselves to Christ by trusting him to forgive us and that we must obey him for the rest of our lives. That sounds like works, people. We must obey him. The Bible says that the salvation is through the obedience of one. Jesus' obedience, just like through one man, Adam, his disobedience, we have death. Through one man, Jesus' obedience, we have life. So he's adding obedience. Do you see this? We obey the gospel. That's trusting Christ. That means to remain steadfast in the truth. But obeying Jesus means to what? That's very vague. Obey his commandments. Well, the two he gave us were to believe on him and to love one another. But again, we're not saved for our love for God or for our love for others, but because he loved us. Again, we're not saved because we give our life to Christ, but because he gave his for us. We get, this, is, this is twisting it, all right? This is very subtle. We trust him to forgive us and that we must obey him for the rest of our lives in order to know him and to find peace and everyone is looking for in life. The fourth category ends with this three-step process on how Pat Robertson says we're supposed to give our lives to Christ. By the way, submitting your will and all this is all obedience. It's all keeping commandments. And everybody throws the ten in there, which is the law, right? The strength of sin is the law, people, not grace. This is subtly twisting the gospel. Now it's not just about Jesus' work that restored you through his blood, but now it's about your work of obedience. Do you see how it's twisted? Now the focus is back on us. And if it's on us, we will be shaken and have no assurance of salvation, nor should we have assurance, because that's not how you're saved. All right? So, he says, we admit we're sinners and we need God's forgiveness. That's true. Second, we must believe that Jesus died on the cross and he came out to life. That's true. Third, he said, we must confess through prayer that Jesus is the only way to God and we must promise to live the rest of our lives for him. None of that, none of that is part of the gospel. Pray in a prayer. You don't have to do any of that. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. Should you pray? Of course. We want to talk to our father. Why not? But that's not part of salvation. That's a work. It's a religious work. All right. Confession. That's a work. All right. Come on. And then promise to live our lives for him. That's service. That's works, works, works. How do you know you're saved if it's dependent upon you giving your life in obedience for the rest of your lives? How would you know? Because now we got to know what if we don't do it for the rest of our lives? What if one day we do it and the next day we don't? What if we have some bad days? What if we backslide? See, it's not about us. And they're putting that, they're adding that to Jesus' work. So now it's turned into Jesus plus you, which is not a contract that God will honor. The contract that he will accept is his son's blood that's offered in the place of the mercy seat in heaven for the sin of the world. And it's only that that washes you clean, okay? Justified freely by his grace, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, all right? Not of yourselves. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. To live our lives for Christ is works of righteousness. He is adding discipleship to salvation. This is a false plan of salvation, and it's about you, and it gives you a place to boast. I'm saved because I trust Jesus. You don't trust him if you're trusting partly in you, by the way. And I'm obedient in my life. I gave my life. What's he going to do with your life except crucify it? Nothing. Doesn't save you. You're saved because he gave his life for you. He said, now at the bottom of the screen, you're given a choice of whether or not you would like to give your life to Christ right now. That doesn't save. You're saved because he gave his. Good gracious. It says when you click upon yes, you will be taken to a page that presents you with a prayer. Here we go. Won't find that in the Bible anywhere. When you look at the uh, Philip and the eunuch, nowhere does he say, you must pray this prayer after me. 
No, he's reading Isaiah. Shows him through the Old Testament how he fulfilled the scriptures as a suffering servant in Isaiah 53. The man says, hey, what prevents me from being baptized? I believe. He goes, hey, if you believe with all thine heart, he said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, then you may be baptized. Okay, don't see a sinner's prayer at all. Okay, so when you watch the 700 Club, Pat Robertson, his son Gordon, and co-host Terry Mewson will without fail present their version of salvation during each episode. The first thing you will notice is a genuine sense of care in their voices and in their facial expressions. Without any doubt at all, it's a pleasure to see the warmth and honesty of their countenances and to hear what they have to say. When I was unsure of my salvation, I'd be so comforted as they told me of God's love and how much he desires to have a relationship with me that I hardly ever missed a show. I did exactly what they told me to do, too. I asked Jesus into my heart. I asked him to forgive me. At the beginning of this book, he tells you he did everything these TV preachers did for a long time. He even had a change of life. And then he never had assurance of salvation because he wasn't saved. Okay? You don't get born again until all your trust is on what Jesus did. Then you have assurance. Why? Because God gives it to you. And if you have a doubt for a second, you're like, what? No. It's all what Jesus did. All right? So, here we go. He said, when I was unsure of my salvation, I'd be so comforted. Then he said, I asked Jesus in my heart. I asked him to forgive me. You don't have to. He already forgave you on the cross. And I truly did my best to live for him through what I thought was the power of the Holy Spirit. However, as warm and as caring as these people are, remember Satan comes to an angel of light as ministers, as ministers of righteousness. They don't mean it. Okay, they don't mean it. I'm not saying that they're overtly evil people. They're caring people. It's just they're wrong presenting the gospel. Okay, they weren't doing the biblical salvific message. Uh, he says, as truly and as heartfelt and touching as their plan of salvation truly sounds, it is not the gospel of the Bible, and I was never born again as a result. In fact, nobody has ever been born again by believing in the plan of salvation presented by the 700 Club because their gospel is different from the gospel presented by Christ in the Bible. Since both cannot be the gospel, one of them is wrong and falls under the curse that is mentioned in the book of Galatians. Specifically, I would like to draw your attention to, first Gal to Galatians 1, 6-8, which states, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we've preached unto you, let him be accursed, anathema. Okay? What the Holy Spirit is saying through Paul in these verses is that false plans of salvation are crafty and they lead people away from the true plan of salvation that can save them once for all. We learn that these other gospels actually pervert or pollute the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We are told that any person with whom we cross paths or even an angel from heaven who teaches, let's think about the Moroni or uh, Nephtali, or the, the Moroni, the angel that gave Joseph Smith another gospel, an angel from heaven. He was a fallen one, but he preached another gospel, and he, and the message, and Joseph Smith, and the Mormons stand condemned for it. It's horrific, and it's why I preach the gospel, because I do care, and I'm not being mean. I'm telling you, I believe what the Bible says, and I stand on it, and the Holy Spirit bears witness to that truth. All right. So he's saying that it's an accursed message. And he said he told uh, Paul and Silas when he talked to the Philippian jailer, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And let me ask you this. This is the one place that is blatantly, overtly clear. He's asking a question. What must I do to be saved? Simplicity. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And it says that Paul preached Jesus crucified and risen to the whole family. And they all believed and they got saved. That's why he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and the house because he was going to preach to them. And I guess the Holy Spirit told him, hey, they're all going to believe it. So he got them all saved. All right. So, and he, he preached them to them in his house. And he said, the command here is to believe on the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to believe on the Savior, to trust that what he did saved you. Most people don't. They think it's Jesus plus something they're doing. 
or you can lose it. Well, how do you think you're keeping it? Oh, by your works. No. You pollute it with your works and you cancel. I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law and Christ is dead in vain. All right. So here's, here's the big thing they're teaching. Partial faith in him and partial faith in living the Christian lifestyle to get into heaven. They're condemned already, according to Christ, because they have not believed in him. Do you notice how Christ said the name of the only begotten Son of God in this verse? The wording explains the authority given to Christ by the Father. In fact, all power and authority has been given to Christ by the Father. In old black and white movies from the past, even the old cartoons we watched as the kids a long time ago say, Stop! In the name of the law! The criminal being chased by the police knew exactly what it meant because the name of the law carries the full weight and authority of the law. The name and the object of that name are one and the same. Maybe that is why Christ said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Look at John 14, 8, 9. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that's seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? A surefire way to success in the Christian business is to present a false plan of salvation. That sounds like the real thing. Let me say that again. A surefire way to success in the Christian business is to present a false plan of salvation. I want you to go to all these big preachers channels and you look at the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of subscribers. I want you to even look at the nobodies that preach the false staunch repent of your sins garbage that can't save anybody. Anything that turns to us, make Christ the Lord of your life, or overt work salvation, and you'll see they have many more subscribers. Because the world loves works, okay, so they can boast in their flesh. They like what sounds righteous, okay? Jesus plus they get to do something, okay? That works for them. All right, so a surefire way to success in the Christian business is to present a false plan of salvation that sounds like the real thing. Satan will then bless the ministry financially so that masses of people will buy into the lie that he, the father of lies himself, has been propagating ever since he brainwashed Cain with murderous jealousy toward Abel over God's denial of his harvested offering, his works, and his acceptance of his brother's blood offering. It's the animal blood of the lamb that Abel offered that God accepted. He did not offer, he did not accept Cain's works of the fruits and vegetables and the works of his harvest. All right. It does not matter how successful a false ministry may become over time because that success is not a measure of God's blessing upon that ministry. For instance, let us examine Jesus's temptation while fasting at the beginning of his ministry. Satan tempted Christ to show off his power by throwing himself from a high place, knowing all along he would not sustain injuries from the fall. Satan also tried to make Christ turn stones into bread, yet Satan also offered to give Christ ruling power over earthly kingdoms. So there, we know they're within his power to give. See, he's the prince of the power of the air, the, the, the little G God of this world, temporarily. Christ preached his victory to the spirits in prison that were sometimes disobedient in the times of Noah. So we know he got the keys to hell, death, and the grave. It's done. His time's a coming. Alright? It's got to play out. So we know he had the power to bless and give kingdoms if, if you'll just worship him. It's a cruel form of deception which few are ever rescued no matter how many times they hear the true plan of salvation after they've been indoctrinated by the satanic deception. How many come on my channel and accuse us of loving sin? You're antinomian. You better repent of your sin. They have no idea what they're saying. And no matter how many times I give them the real gospel or they hear the real gospel, they're like, la, 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 la. what about repentance? What about it? I have repented. I've changed my mind and trusted in Christ and stopped trusting in myself. They, they won't hear it. For gospel be hid, to be hid to them that are lost. And the hardest thing to do is to get somebody saved that thinks they already are. All right? So, likewise, those who trust in CBN's plan of salvation rather than in Christ's plan of salvation are at a tremendous disadvantage and they're apt never to pay attention to what the Lord himself said about being born again because they've been convinced by satanic deception, i.e., the, quote, genuine warmth and compassion of the voices and the faces to which they are drawn that in reality only draws them away from Christ's simple, solitary requirement of, quote, belief in him alone and toward the false plan of instructing them to commit their lives to Christ and discipleship 
in addition to partial faith in what Jesus did for them at the cross. See, Jesus doesn't save people that are trying to be saved. He saves them that trust that he did save them, okay? He says that, uh, so the, the, the deception here is he's adding discipleship in Christ, giving your life over to Christ as a disciple in service, and then partial faith in what Jesus did. That is not the contract that God will honor for salvation. You will not be born again, partly trusting in what you do. Do you hear me? Please, don't believe me. Go look it up. You cannot trust in Christ and trust in yourself. All right? It must be him. It says that they, at first it says there's no works. So they he employs a bait and switch technique. That first says no works, and then subtly adds works. Oh, man, this is the big one. Don't claim it's grace. I can't tell you how many people come over here defending John MacArthur and Ray Comfort. They teach grace through faith, but then they'll tell you, repent of your sins, give your life to Christ, submit your will to the Lord, to the Lordship. They tell you all this stuff, or just count the cost, pick up your cross and follow him, give up everything for Jesus. They'll never, it, it, it's all works. It's all what you're doing. But then they'll say it's not of works. You see, and people can't see that it's works because they're not saying, hey, you got to keep the law, but they really are saying you got to keep the law. They're not saying it's works, but they're really preaching works, but naming it something else, uh, giving your life to Jesus, something subtle that sounds right. It, it's so scary to me that people can't see past this. You got to get so familiar with the real thing that a counterfeit, you can spot it like that. They say that people in the banks, they don't study counterfeits. They study the real money. So when a counterfeit, they can spot it like that. And that's what you got to do. This is your eternal destination, people. You, you can't be fooled by people because you like them or they're sincere. They are sincerely wrong. I, I don't care how sweet they are. Do you remember I said they're so warm and loving? And they give you the wrong gospel. It's not you giving your life. So they're subtly adding works. They're saying it's no works. And then subtly adding works later in this process. Thereby canceling Christ's grace with the corruption of human works. Robertson's gospel is not the true gospel of the Bible. It is a counterfeit gospel. It will never save those who place their trust in it. And then he says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, whose faith in earth, it faced the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, see, he's God of the living, not the God of the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. So he's going to look over their life, and the dead are judged out of those things that are written in those books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead. If you want to rely on your works, you're going to be judged for your works. Do you hear me? And you're going to fall short. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You better trust in what he did alone and not your works. You can hear in Matthew 7, 21, but Lord, Lord, did we do this and that and this and that and all our wonderful works? Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. You work iniquity. Your works are iniquity. You cannot rely on your works. All right? The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire hell is hades the dwelling of the dead this is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire revelation 20 11. that is the sad reality of adding human works to god's grace yet of course you're free to choose this day whom you will believe now the next uh video i'll do is the plan of salvation according to rick warren i i'm I skipped a chapter because I'm hesitant to do the one on Charles Stanley because I've heard him give the real gospel so many times and the thing he he kind of adds I can't really say it's almost discipleship he adds to it but I, I know I've heard him give the real gospel and speak against works and against losing salvation so much I hesitate to do that so I've skipped him right now until I read the chapter more thoroughly and do some more research okay because I know Charles Stanley is a true man of God and some of these men could be but what they preach is accursed okay it's not the biblical plan of salvation all right uh, I'll move on to the next one which will be on Rick Warren um, he's kind of a new age you know the world loves him anyway God bless